Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm. Everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for episode 450 and the 10th anniversary of my podcast. I want you to say hi to everybody over here. Hi, everybody. Hi. There we go. Can we do that again? Come on. There we go. We'll try that again. Try that again. There we go. Try that again. There we go. The camera wasn't playing nice. There we go. Hi, everyone. All right. We're done with that camera because it wasn't tracking my face earlier. So uh, thank you all really for coming here. It's an honor to be able to present this in front of everybody. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. A uh, brief history of Leet Wine TV. Um, so uh, first of all, I, I just want to say it's good to be back in front of a live audience. Um, I don't have Tony Stark's Iron Man suit. I don't have, you know, I don't have ACDC playing, though that was actually the first song during our setup. And I'm not jumping out of a C-130. I wish I could, but I couldn't. Uh, so the name, if you didn't already know, the name is inspired by a uh, Cabernet Sauvignon called 337. It's actually um, produced by Noble Wines. Uh, that's actually next week's episode. So uh, in the beginning is what it's called. Um, reviewing uh, the two wines that actually got me into wine, or the wine that got me into wine, and also the wine that started this. Um, I, and they still haven't sued me yet, so thank God. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to be kind of the next Gary V or Gary Vayner Chuck. If you don't know who he is, look him up, Wine Library TV. Um, though not as brash, though I love Gary. Um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's go backwards. Um, first episode was May 28, 2009. So for those of you at home, it's tomorrow. For those of you here, it's a week from tomorrow. Um, and uh, I started off doing five days a week. Uh, one wine, five days a week. And uh, about two weeks after I started this, I quit my job. Right, Taryn? <laughs> Taryn was there. Um, so I quit my job, and then I didn't have a job for four months. So doing five days a week wine started getting expensive on unemployment. So I switched down to three days a week, and I actually, I actually held that for quite a while. Um, now I do once a week, and this is probably the longest stretch of weeks in a row I've done uh, in the history of the podcast. And I still have about two more months of episodes coming up, That uh, almost two more months of episodes coming up. Uh, and it was really to be a diary of my wine studies to help me pass these silly exams that we take. We spent a lot of money on to get these little 50 cent pens, but we all do it and we all love it. Um, so some stats on Leet Wine. Uh, so the la latest stats I could download says I have over 300,000 views on all channels. It's probably closer to 450,000, but I can't retrieve those stats, so I'm not gonna necessarily say that I have that, though I just did. Uh, I'm the only on wine, online video wine show that combines wine reviews, education, and interviews. Now, there are plenty of video shows out there that do these things. There's, of course, a lot of audio podcasts that do interviews and talk about wine also, but I'm the only one who does exactly what I do. Um, the only independently produced video wine podcast in the history of video wine podcasting. Even Gary, you were not by yourself. You had Mott. Yeah. You got Chris Mott and somebody else and people editing, but I love you, Gary. Um, other ones are produced by like Jordan Winery. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's a few other people that have video, uh, video wine shows and they have money behind them. Um, but there's only one other video wine show that I know of, and that's James Melendez, the, the, uh, James the Wine Guy on YouTube, and he's totally self-produced. So that's the only one I really know of, and he's, he kicks ass because he has like, I don't know, like 2,000 episodes or something. Um, so you should check him out. Um, I'm the longest running video wine podcast as far as I know. Um, and then uh, I have the equivalent of 17 years of television when you consider a full season is upwards of 26 episodes, unlike some show that ended yesterday that only puts out eight or 10 a year, a season, that's bullshit. Um, uh, some more things, so in the history, or during, during the whole 10 years, I've reviewed 555 wines, two ciders, one beer, um, and seven spirits were either uh, reviewed or tasted for some various reason. Uh, I've had 71 guests on the show. Some of them were interviews, some of them were just special guests. sessie has been on my show, what, three times, something like that? You actually, you, you and Melissa were three episodes, but it was one thing, and then 
uh, you're at the house, so well, a couple times at least, and Chris was on the show. Um, uh, there's been 132 countries, the last count that I've actually seen at least once uh, these, this, uh, this uh, podcast, though I had some other stats that said kind of like the whole 30,000, uh, 300,000 that I think it was closer to like 160 countries, but like it was like some country somewhere that small country saw once, so it's no big deal. Um, and I visited 33 wine areas throughout the 10 years, uh, though I did say like you got Burgundy and then, you know, the sub region, so. Um, so yeah, so we are, oh yeah, tonight's show. So I had to pick three wines. I, I mean, I picked three wines, but I didn't have to pick three wines. I picked three wines, and when I first started, came up with this idea, I was sitting there talking with Scott, and I was like, this is what I want to do. I just want like three wines I like, and Scott's like, well, you probably should have stuff that means something to you. You know, maybe people that helped you out, you know? <sighs> um, so yeah, that's why these three people are chosen. Um, so I'll, I'll go over the reason why I picked the three wineries, and, uh, but I could have picked a, a shit ton of them. Um, people have been watching the show a lot, know that I've been doing a lot of interviews, um, and that's actually what I'd like the show to become at some point, but right now I'm still balancing between reviews and interviews, and um, I might go to two shows a week, just because I got a shit ton of wine to like review, like a shit ton. All right, so let's get to wine number one. All right, so this is why well, I can barely read that. Um, okay, so Pedernado Cellars. Uh, so uh, I picked them. Um, they were one of my early Texas interviews. I went to them in December 2012. The show came out in January 2013. Um, so why did I pick them? Um, they, we became mutual supporters over the years. Um, I kind of developed a friendship with them um, of all the Texas wineries, you know, and I I've, I've know a lot of Texas wineries. I've, I've been to a lot of them, but these are the ones I kept coming back to. They welcomed me, all, welcomed me all the time, so I really was happy to go there. Um, and they're really one of the top Texas wineries. You know, they're part of the Texas Fine Wine Group, um, so they, they make some really good wine. So we're tasting uh, the 2016 Viognier. It retails for about $18. Um, uh, the clip we're going to watch is from 2012, from that first... I visited them twice, by the way. Uh, they were episode 400. Um, so this is from 2012. Uh, we have the three founders, uh, David Culkin, Frederick Osterberg, and Dr. Julie Culkin. That's in the order of how they talk or how they speak, whatever. And uh, so we're going to watch that. Here. So we're going to start off with uh, Viognier. So why Viognier? Why does it work so well here in Texas? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, I, I see it a lot and I enjoy it. I love Texas Viognier. Um, why Viognier? Well, I mean, without getting into a lot of the, like, the specific details, I mean, understand that the process of finding varietals like these has been an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we've, like I was just talking about, we've experimented in our vineyard. Viognier, in particular, a lot of the High Plains growers, like the Binghams and the Reddies, have experimented with this grape. And it's been a discovery process. You know, there's, you make certain, you know, assumptions about when you look at regions, you look at their wines, you look at their soils and climates. And, and ideally, we typically look to places like the Southern Rhone grapes, to Spain for varietals, but then it's the experimentation of, okay, let's put them in our vineyards, let's find out how they do and how we need to adapt them if we need to in terms of how we manage them to make them work. And, you know, Viognier, first of all, I, I really love the varietal. I love the, you know, the aromas you can get from a Viognier. So um, that's a good start, obviously. You want to work with something that you'd like to make a wine with, but you, you, you find as you get things that are distinct to growing it in your own, your own region. Um, and Viognier has been that. It's gone through this process over the last 10 to 15 years of small experiments turning into larger plantings and now actually being a really commercially planted grape. And we love it, the winery. It is absolutely a fantastic grape for us. Um, we're learning every year, but improving as we go and discovering how we can bring out the best out of the varietal. So, nice. And I think, I think, I think Viognier is, is getting recognized as one of the top grapes for for Texas um, when we went to um, the San Francisco International Wine Competition and, and got a gold medal. It was the Viognier that got the gold mm -hmm. medal. It was, it was this Viognier here that, that won the Houston Rodeo um, competition this year. And yeah. So it's, it's, it's up there. It's a grape and we can make world-class wine from Viognier in Texas. The other thing that's interesting about the Viognier is that you know, not all whites can, can take barrel aging Viognier sure. can, so you can sure. get these variations uh, like mm -hmm. the Reserve it's, it's very often have the, the barrel aging. So you get yeah. you know, different wines, both of which, uh, in fact, last year with the 2011, which unfortunately has ceased to be in existence, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is, I mean, to, to taste the, the reserve next to the non-reserve. I mean, mm -hmm. you had people who, you know, liked one or the other, uh, but they were just, they were two really great wines, right? Both from the same grape. You yeah. can right. see 
the, the, you know, here's the winemaking coming into play and really saying, you know, there's lots of things we can do with this because it's such a good grape. So. All right. So first question I always ask when I'm conducting tastings, and don't worry if you don't like it, but do you like the wine? Show of hands, you like the wine? You don't like the wine? I, uh, cool. You don't like the wine? I'm not worried about it. I didn't make it. <laughs> Sorry, David. Um, and uh, would anyone like to comment on the wine? There's no reason to comment if you don't have to or don't want to. But if anyone would like to say anything about it, I'm sorry? It smells sweet. It smells sweet, okay. You get any like floral aspect out of it? Yeah, that's very, very much characteristic of Viognier. Um, anyone want else comment about the wine? And I'm gonna ask for all three wines. You don't have to comment. Okay, the less you comment, the faster we get going. But anyway, go ahead, Ceci. <laughs> I really like the expression that Viognier takes here in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, I've been able to taste a lot of it and um, I love Viognier from wherever it comes from in the world, but I really saw how powerful, even more powerful and fragrant it expresses itself coming from Texas. Yeah. And in particular, Pernalis, they have a long library and history of just producing like, consistently, I mean, really great quality Viognier. Yeah. And, and this is why I chose this wine in particular, not just, you know, not just anything from Pernalis. I mean, the Viognier is something that's kind of a signature grape for them. Uh, that and Tempranillo, that's really the two grapes that they've really kind of built their winery on. They make other stuff, but these are like the two things that they, they really built their uh, built the winery on. Um, so we're going to wine number two now. All right, so wine number two, uh, this is the Ben Ziger, not Ben, ben, ben I, I can't even pronounce it wrong, Ben Ziger, uh, not Behringer, uh, family winery. Um, I visited them in 2014. Actually, some of the pictures uh, from the slideshow um, are from this visit, um, and we're going to see them again, not so go by so fast. Um, so why I picked this winery? Um, this is, of the 10 years that I've, well, I've only really visited wineries like nine years, but of the 10 years of doing the show, this is the best example of biodynamics I've ever seen, like an actual, like, ecosystem. I've seen, I've gone to, I've gone to wineries that say they do biodynamics or organic, but I didn't, I didn't see the ecosystem. Maybe it was there, I just didn't see it. Um, they have excellent wines at all price points. They have everything from like 10-ish dollars up to this one. This one retails for about $85. Uh, it's 2014 tribute. This is actually the year I went. This is the year I went to Benziger. Um, that's, so I was really happy that that's the current release. Um, and we're going to see a clip. It's about four-ish minutes from Jeffrey Landolt. Uh, he's, uh, at the time, I don't know if he's still there. I should have probably checked it out. But he was the viticulturalist. Uh, and he really talks about biodynamics and why they use it. Um, and why it helped them, especially in that particular year. So we'll watch that one, and I'm going to get my wine. Yeah, uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Um, it's, always, it's always nice to show people uh, this property, which is our flagship property. We have multiple vineyards throughout Sonoma County that we farm organically and biodynamically. Uh, however, this is, uh, like I said earlier, this is kind of the mothership mm -hmm. of, of everything we do. It's... Uh, it's the place where we want people to come and experience um, our wines. It's a place that we want to show as our, our showpiece, if you will, for 15 years plus of commitment to biodynamics. And um, biodynamics, in a, real, in a real simple way of, of explaining it, is just the next level in organics. Um, we've, uh, we've seen that uh, the biodynamics that we practice is really how our ancestors farmed. Right. And it's, it's a very simplistic approach um, of giving back to nature, uh, keeping a full bank account in, in, in our reserves out there instead of constantly just taking from the vineyard. We're constantly giving back. And um, our, our commitment to biodynamics, um, like I said, has been going on for 15 plus years. And the neat thing about biodynamics, from my perspective, being out in the vineyards every day is that in, in an average year, the people that grow biodynamically you're not going to really see it, right? Because in an average year, most people do okay. Okay. But yeah. we're in the third year of a drought now, in or we were in 2014, and quite possibly the fourth year of a drought in 2015, and that's where you really see the differences in our commitments to bio biodynamics. Uh, composting uh, every single year for 15 years uh, creates a, a real stockpile of nutrients. Um, and microorganisms that make further nutrients available for the plant. So 
in 2014, we saw biodynamics win out. And I think that's the important thing is, is in an average year, you're not going to see a huge difference in what we do, uh, which we kind of term organics 2.0. We, we view it as like another layer of organics. So most people are familiar with organic farming. We take that a step further and we apply, we apply homeopathic teas um, right. that have been composted. Um, over uh, a year's time, sometimes six months' time. Um, so the composting nature of it condenses um, whatever flour or whatever type of tea that we are trying to prepare. And then we go out and we either spray that directly on the foliage or on the ground, um, depending on what type of preparation we're putting out there. So you have organics, and then we, we have an, an, a next level of organics, which is really the original form of organics, which is biodynamics. Right. And, and we, we, we involve animals. Um, you can't have this type of program without uh, the use of animals. We have uh, Scottish Highlander cattle, and then we also have um, a species of a sheep that we, that we use in, in usually the off-season because sheep are pretty aggressive on eating the leaves. But right. uh, we have those guys out there all winter, and they, they aerate the soil with their feet. Um, they spread manure um, as they go through, right. and they also eat the weeds when we can't get tractors in. So it's a very, it's a very unique system, and we like to view it as a cl as a closed system. And our goal is to is to someday have this property act almost by itself in in the way that a, a that a forest does. And we're very close to the forest, so we're constantly reminded of that being in the shadow of Sonoma Mountain, that's a huge forest up there. And it's, it's a constant reminder that, that that's the end goal is to have a 100% self-sustaining system. And, and we're getting there. It just, right. it just takes a long time. So I was mentioning earlier that, um, you know, this, this, this biodynamics is, is something that shows itself in a tough year, like we had in 2014, really low water levels. Um, but we have stable tonnage. Um, and that's, that's really the key for us is to create balance in the vineyard so that we don't get a roller coaster of tonnages because that's really hard for the winemakers and it's really hard for sales to right. plan on, on a roller coaster type system. But if we have a general idea of how much tons we're going to get off of each property, it, uh, it really helps everyone involved in it and it really helps the vines. The vines thrive in a balanced system. All right, so that um, that interview, he goes a lot more into biodynamics, but I had to pick something, and so that was I picked that part. But there's a lot more stuff, and definitely you want to you should watch the entire interview because he basically gives you a, a lesson on what biodynamics is and how it how it works for them. So um, I'm going to show you some pictures while you're tasting the wine. Um, these are some pictures uh, from the visit at the winery. Um, so this is some of the vineyards, but you can also see they just have a diversity of um, Plant life there. Uh, again, more of the vineyards and the diversity of plant life. I don't want to stand in front of too many people, um, but I got to be in front of the camera. So, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so some more of the vineyards. This is uh, they have two they have two ponds uh, that they use for water reclamation. So this is the first one, and then it filters through the ground to another pond, which is that picture there. Um, Jeffrey said during the tour that you could drink it if you'd like. It won't taste really good, but you won't die from it. You won't get sick. Um, and then uh, all, they have olive trees on the property, um, just other diversity of plant life. Uh, there's the cows, the cattle. Um, and then this is going up one side of the hill. This is on the east side uh, of their property. So funny story, um, we're in a golf cart. So it's myself, Jeffrey, and Dad. Dad so Dad got to go on this, this Napa trip. It was really the first time he really kind of saw what life with Mark is like. Um, and he's, he's definitely spoiled because I actually told a story to, um, somebody at work that when you guys went to, uh, in December, you went out to the hill country on a Saturday and they, you, you left because it was too busy. I was like, yeah, that's because we don't go on Saturdays. <laughs> okay. We go during the week when there's nobody there. Um, so anyway, we're, we're driving, uh, we're driving in the, in the golf cart and we hadn't gotten to this part yet, but we're kind of like leaning and I'm in the passenger seat. We're leaning this way. And picture me about, you know, 70-ish pounds heavier. And I thought we literally were going to tip over, like, multiple times. Um, so this is we get at the top of the hill. We're facing, um, we're facing west. Um, these, I don't remember which ones are which, but this is, this is one varietal, and that's a different varietal. And you can see the color difference 
and this is in November, so you know the, the leaves are turning, and it's that shows you that there's actually differences in what grapes do, uh, even when they when they are harvested. This is what they call the insectary, um, and this is a key thing for the biodynamics. So throughout the day, different insects or bugs or creatures or whatever leave that insectary, and they go to different parts of the vineyard, and they act as pest control. Um, besides the, the, the teas that they use, um, which we'll get to that in a second. So, I mean, this was one of the most impressive things I've, I've really seen at a winery, uh, besides like looking at the fancy tanks and the about $1,500 French wine barrels. Um, and this is uh, the, the olive trees from farther away. Um, this is the manure. I know no, not everyone wants to look at a picture of shit, but this is very, this is very like key. By the way, there will be an explicit tag on this. <laughs> um, I don't normally say these things on, on the podcast. Um, and this is where they make their teas. Um, so they use manure and other things. Um, I didn't, I don't remember asking Jeffrey if they planted the cow horn, but you're supposed to like have a cow horn. You put the stuff in there, you bury it for a certain number of months, you bring it back out and you spray it, you know, like a, like a herbicide or fungicide or whatever. I don't remember if they do that, but if they don't do that, it's the only thing they don't do. And I also don't think they, and I do think they use like the moon and all that. I don't think it's too, too crazy with like leaf day and fruit day. Um, so on the wine, do you like the wine? Yeah? Would you have liked the wine if I told you it was like 15 bucks instead of 85? Okay, good. Because it's still $85. Okay. I just didn't want the price to influence you, but I didn't want you to know how much it was. Plus, I need to tell my viewers at home what it is. Uh, would anyone like to comment on the wine? It's a unique smell. I've never yeah. had a wine like that. Okay. Um, Can you describe the smell? Smooth. Um, I, I think of the forest. Like, I Perfect. Think, like woods. Like, yeah. But the taste is like down my throat is very smooth. Mm -hmm. I, I can appreciate that. Yeah. Um, not a harsh going down, but it's good. Yeah, and, and you probably don't drink stuff that's five years old, right? It's probably like two, three years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was actually surprised that 14 was available. Um, so I was really happy being that I, that's when I visited them. Uh, for, those of, for those of you that were in some group today, uh, all the wines that I brought out were either 09 or 08. And then I also had a 1990 uh, Riesling. So it was pretty awesome. Anyway, um, let's move on to wine number three. That's their cue to pour the champagne. Uh, and while they're pouring the champagne, actually, if... Um, I don't know how hard it is for you guys to pour and talk. Do you guys want to talk about the stuff that they're eating real quick? You got some cheeses and some stuff? Sure. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> the best things to go with wine are meats and cheeses. Uh, smoked up breasts, uh, that's going to be from out of Hudson Valley, New York. It's a company called Fabrique. Uh, their warehouses are actually in New Jersey, but third generation family from Bronx. Uh, and then the cheese uh, is going to be a triple creamed um, pasteurized cow's milk cheese uh, called uh, Mount Tam. Uh, and that's going to be from Cowgirl Creamery, and they're based out of Marion County. Uh, they're one of the first people to do a blue cheese uh, uh, from pasture cows, as well as um, this particular style. They're also known for a red hop, too. But we love them because they go really, really well, and they show the elegance uh, of a lot of wines. And so you'll typically find these two staples on our program all the time. Uh, we also have Dijon mustard, cornichons, uh, and a local honey from Holden. You can find them at the market. And they, what I think is super cool about them uh, being a terroir-driven honey, they actually label their honeys by county. All right. If you guys have questions, I'm more than happy to help you. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of speak to that. Like honey, well, I'll, I, I know a little bit, but they probably know a little bit, a little bit more. So honey actually is terroir-driven. It's based upon the pollen that the bees are getting from whatever's around. I didn't really didn't know that until a few years ago. I haven't like compared honeys, but you can. I mean, if you're like like a honey connoisseur, I'm sure you can definitely taste the difference. Um, all right, so Bruno Payard, that's what we're going to be having here. So um, it was built from the ground up in 1981. They're basically the first new champagne house in nearly a century. Though I thought I read something that there was another one that came around, around uh, before them within the century, but we'll go with that. Um, so why this wine? Well, this is actually a, a kind of a, I don't want to say a payback, but a thank you for the, my friends at Creative Palette who send me a lot of wine for free. I get a lot of sample wines. This happens to be one of the ones that they send me um, every year for the past like two or three years. Um, so they've been really supportive of me. And then they were very instrumental in 
Uh, you remember the, in the slideshow, you saw, saw a picture of me in front of a thing that says ProVine or ProWine, right? Oh, well, they were instrumental in getting me an interview with this guy at ProVine, which was on the third day, the last day of it. And he, at, as soon as the interview was over, he drove back to Rons. That's how it's pronounced, yes? Rams, yeah, something like that. It looks like Reims, but you know, one of, the, one of the major towns in Champaign, he had to drive back there for a dinner party. He drove from Dusseldorf to there. It was like a five hour drive, I think. Um, so he, he spent, it was closer to, I put 20 minutes, it was closer to like 30 minutes he spent with me, but the interview's 19 minutes long, and we're gonna watch it. Um, and then we are tasting the non vintage Premier Cuvée. Uh, it retails for about 50 bucks. Unfortunately, the 2009 will not be released until September. Otherwise, I definitely would have had it for you guys. Um, I did taste it, though. It was pretty good. Um, so let's watch Bruno. Not Mars. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Bruno Payard, and he's going to talk to you about his wine. I want to thank all of you for coming to my 10th anniversary show. So this is a special treat that I actually get to hang out with the man who's, who makes the wine that you're all having right now. It's going to be the premier cuvee. So Bruno, Bruno, uh, go ahead and kind of give a, a little biography about you and why you started a wine. <laughs> why, I mean, why you started a champagne house, of all things. Full, full biography. I think it might be boring. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, no, I was born in Champagne in 53. Okay. And my father was was a grape broker and we I come from a very old family of growers but uh, we I come also from a family of six children and mm -hmm. uh, after I worked uh, as a broker for uh, six years I decided to leave because I wanted to create champagne and my father was not so keen in investing in um, producing maison and so on. So that's the reason why I started my maison. And it's true, I started, I started from scratch. Yes. <laughs> so it's a bit crazy, right? You know, to open a champagne house is a little more complicated than to just open a bottle of champagne. Mm -hmm. But you know how to open a bottle of champagne, by the way, you know? You just yeah. un unscrew the, the, the little wire, you mm -hmm. maintain it firmly on the bottle, then you, you, you maintain the cork, and you turn not the cork but you turn the bottle like this and then you will see the cork is coming very slowly very naturally you don't need to make any effort and when you feel the cork is coming you just turn the bottle and you immediately serve a first drop voilà. so this is how we are going to to share our premier cuvee uh, Bruno Paya premier cuvee and I think that then we can we can talk much better if we have Absolutely. a glass in our hand. Absolutely. <laughs> voilà. So as you notice, you barely heard anything, right? This is not, you just don't pop it open, because then, then you lose all the champagne. <laughs> you could if you want. Yeah, yeah. but it's, it, it's a, uh, the elegant way to open a bottle of champagne is to make a small pop yep. discreetly, and to avoid the, the wine to go through the cork, you immediately pour a little bit. Mm -hmm. voilà. Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. À votre santé. À votre santé, as we say in French. Mm. <laughs> voilà, so this premier cuvée is the most important wine at Maison Bruno Payard because it represents about half of my production. Okay. And it's, the name premier cuvée is not defined by any legal thing. It's, it's just the fact, it's written on the back level, is the fact that I use only the first pricing to produce this wine. It's a composition of our three main varieties it is in Champagne, but 32 parcels or crews are involved in the composition. And of course, the list is kept secret because mm -hmm. this is our little secret. Right. Importantly to say, it's a wine that has a minimum aging on the lees inside the bottle. You know, the lees are created by the bottle fermentation mm -hmm. as well as the bubble, so they come naturally. And the lees we will have to uh, eliminate, of course, before we uh, offer the bottle to the consumers because otherwise the wine would be cloudy, would not be uh, bright <laughs> as it is now. So the moment where we eliminate the, the lees is what we call dégorgement. Okay. And the dégorgement is one, so we, it's like an operation for the bottle. You know, we, we open the bottle, we remove something, we put something else, about one centiliter of reserve wines with what's called the dosage, and then we, we, we recock the bottle. So it's really like a surgery. The wine needs a rest after it. Okay. 
So on Which all, on I had all, surgery last year. I know what you mean. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. So I, I worry it was not too bad, but no, it was all right. <laughs> it's a so the recovery rest that we give is a minimum of six months. Mm -hmm. So this bottle of Premier Cuvée will never leave Maison Bruno Payard before it has a minimum of 42 months in the bottle. Okay. Okay. That's very important for the purity, the elegance of the of the blend. So now when you smell the wine, you have pure aromas of white almond, mm -hmm. uh, citrus fruit, a yes. little bit of red berries coming through. Yeah. And a, maybe others. No, what what would you feel as as, as much as it? I like. Um, I get a bit of orange and tangerine. Orange and tangerine. Yeah. Very typical of the yeah. importance of Chardonnay from specific places, from Grand Cru, where the terroir, where the subsoil mm -hmm. is massive white chalk. Right. Which yes. we just had that little piece of chalk here. Anyway, you had some yeah. chalk. Oh, there it is, right there. Sure. So <laughs> literally, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's a tiny piece, but yeah, it's a tiny piece, but it's literally the same kind of of chalk, the wine we use to, to write on the blackboard, you see? Yeah. I can sign it for you. <laughs> see? Bruno. There you go. It doesn't write very well, but... <laughs> with so, love, yeah. with love. And there you see, you go. it leaves you... The, your, your, your fingers are a bit, a bit white after. This is this chalk, and this chalk comes from uh, the residues of sea life 40 million years ago, because in our region, of Champagne. It used to be an ocean, it used mm -hmm. to be a sea. Right. Long time ago. I, I was not born. Okay, you yeah, <laughs> I wasn't born either. <laughs> we are talking of 40 to 80 million of years when uh, this place was a sea and uh, the residues of sea lice, I mean all the, all the bones of the fish and so on, everything eats, eats each other, you know, consistently, but but not the bones. You know, it mm -hmm. becomes this sediment. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a mineral which is in fact a an animal origin. Right. And yeah. this is what gives the iodic feeling that sometimes, or the slightly salty uh, feeling that you get in very pure champagne, where you don't have high dosage of sugar, which right. in fact hides the wine. Me at Maison Brio Fire, I produce exclusively extra brut champagne. Mm -hmm. Extra brut means the sh sh residual sugar is always less than six grams. Mm -hmm. That is very dry, in fact. Yes. Not 100% not, not dry. Right, right. To be 100% dry, you need to be dosage zero. Mm -hmm. we, we also do one. Yes. But, uh, that was beautiful, we, by the way. Thank yeah, you for but we showing do, that but, earlier. But we do not do any wine that is uh, sweeter than extra brut. Right. You know, brut is twice as sweet as extra brut. Yes. So I do not even produce produce brut. I produce only extra brut. And then the, the, the point, the idea is to show the minerality. So we, we deliver plenty of fruit, but also maybe not on the nose, of course, but when you start tasting the wine, you will feel this minerality. Right. Very nice. Cheers. Cheers again. So also on the nose, I mean, with with the lees contact and everything, you get you get that that um, brioche, uh, the the bakery, the, the bready type of smell. Um, and for me, the, on this on the fruit notes, it's, it's more of the orange fruits. Though I can see a little bit of lemon in there on, on the citrus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we get um, the, the the first impression is clearly on citrus fruit. Mm -hmm. Then you start to get a bit of almond, and then mm -hmm. when the one warms up starts to brace a little bit, you will have also little red berries aroma, mm -hmm. like a, a red currant or raspberries, you know. Okay, yeah. it's, it's absolutely natural. It's, it comes from the important part of Pinot Noir in the blend. Yeah. And on, on the palate, I get the, al I get the almond way more on the palate than the nose. Um, and it's it's a beautiful, smooth wine, um, great mouthfeel. Um, long time viewers of the show know I've reviewed uh, this wine, I think two or three times now, uh, last two or three years so to me it's an honor to be able to sit next to the man who's responsible for that um, and this is why um, I've chosen this wine uh, my friends at Creative Palette um, have been supplying me with, with this wine for review among other wines um, but since it's a celebratory show I wanted to have some champagne and who better than Bruno Payard to help me with that and for him to sit down with me for a few minutes is, is uh, pretty incredible so thank you my, my pleasure <laughs>
So, uh, what I can also add is that since uh, since the first days of Maison Bruno Paya, I have never been looking for big volumes, yes. only for quality. So I have developed little by little through several uh, acquisitions of small estates. I have developed an, an extraordinary vineyard, uh, 34 hectares. That is about 70 acres. It's mm -hmm. not not very big, but for Champagne it is big. Mm -hmm. More importantly, its location. They are located all on this kind of terroir where you get this, this, this white chalk, which unfortunately is not the case everywhere in Champagne, but in my vineyard it's very important. Important to say also, we pluck the soil, so to oblige the roots not to live horizontally like that, but we oblige the roots, we want to oblige the roots to go vertical, so right. to extract this minerality, which I think is unique and is very important. And we do not hide the wine with sugar, as I said, because right. our dosage is only extra brut. Mm -hmm. So we, we really come as close to, to uh, as close as possible to the, to the truth of our terroir of Champagne, which I think is is is, is our real asset. Yes, I, I, this this poor soil. It's not a rich soil with rich grass, you can imagine. Right, right. It's a poor soil, but it's, it delivers this unique minerality. And also our climate is not so rich. We are not mm -hmm. uh, in the south, we are not in California. Right, we, are, yeah. <laughs> we, are, we are a kind of Nordic vineyard mm -hmm. with a, a, a part of, of uh, oceanic influence, but uh, only for a small part. The major part is semi-continental, because mm -hmm. it's coming from sometimes quite cold winters. And uh, hot summers, yeah, and dry summers. So that is the reason why we can make wines. Yeah, because Champagne is a region where we have been making wine since the Roman times, mm -hmm. the 20th centuries. Uh, but uh, modern Champagne, the sparkling wine we know, goes back to nine to, to 17, uh, 1728 exactly when King Louis XV authorized the Champenois to bottle their wine so they could capture. The, the natural effervescence due to the second fermentation, yes, which was something that was happening because of our climate. Right. Very often we would pick the grapes in September or October, and sometimes the winter would come too quickly before the, f the, the first fermentation is fully conducted, and therefore even if we racked the wine from one barrel to the other, what would happen is that in the following spring or summer, when the temperature warms up, then a secondary fermentation would start. And that was a totally natural phenomenon that was considered an accident, but it was natural. So Champagne is a wine that has historically fermented twice, but the second fermentation usually was in barrel. Okay. So it was, in a way, it was lost. So it's only since it has been made inside the bottle that this natural accident could be turned into an advantage right. and, and, and extract this little effervescence that is, of course, one of the characteristics of Champagne. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an amazing process. It's very complicated. Um, it's very technical. Um, and in the old days, it was dangerous because they were using coal, uh, wood-fired glass. Yeah. And then they got coal-fired glass, which made it strong enough to handle that, that you know, to handle the, the pressures that yeah. were in there. Yeah. Yeah. In the first days of this kind of what we call technology revolution, in the, yeah. in the early 1700s, there have been many people got uh, ruined because, for instance, the bottles were not strong enough to resist the pressure. Mm -hmm. and so many bottles exploded and they were just lost all their wines. You yeah. know? So, so <laughs> that was one of the of the of the issues. Also the corks. Before we used cork cork, we tried all sorts of systems to close the bottles. Mm -hmm. It did not always work. So the wine was lost also. So today the cork is there for the uh, to, to keep the, the, the wine and also the pressure inside. Mm -hmm. And we have this little wire here, which is here to keep the cork. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it would go it away. Would just go, yeah. <laughs> course, yeah. It would just go away. I've done that before. I've taken off the cage and just not really thinking. I mean, I always knew better, but I've taken off the cage sometimes and then I've just kind of left it on the table. And then a few minutes later, all of a sudden, here's pop. I'm like, yeah. oh. You and know, it was like I was stupid because you know, no, I knew better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I recommend you always leave the wire on the cork mm -hmm. because it's easier when you maintain it on the, yes. in your hand. You know, it's like a, a chain on your tires in the snow. Right, yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you have a better, uh, uh, better maintenance and you, t and you don't never try to turn the cork. Just turn the bottle gently, gently, 
gently. Oh yeah. And when you feel the cork is coming, you just start turning it a little bit like that. So it make a little like that. Not a big bump. It's not very elegant. Yeah, yeah. It may be fun if you are yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you have plenty of friends. I, I occasionally would do that. Yeah, you'll do that but, occasionally. But not, right, not, yeah. not in a uh, in a normal, not normal life. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I, I must say. You. I must confess. I drink champagne almost every day. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on, only twice or three times a day. <laughs> okay. Only two. That's a good life to have, right? Champagne is a wine. Uh, sometimes people forget that champagne is also wine, not just a celebratory drink. Champagne is a wine, and it is, as such, it is designed, it is produced to be enjoyed with food, not just with celebration or as an aperitif. It is important, of course, it's the best aperitif, it's the best celebration, but it's also a wine that matches food very well, particularly if it is extra brut, like my wines, because they do not bring sugar or whatever, they do not conflict with food. You know, Maison Bruno Payard, we are a very small producer, but we, we supply 500 Michelin star restaurants in the world. Okay. Which is incredible for our small size. It's really our speciality to create great champagne with purity and minerality to match great food. Yeah. But you can also have it not just with very fine, but also with spicy food. You can yes. try it with Thai food, for instance, or even Mexican food. Mm -hmm. Believe me, it's going to be extraordinary. My, uh, the champagne is such a versatile wine. It, you can have it with, with so many things. Um, you know, and for me, I always like I always like this as my starting wine with whatever my first course is, because I just like it. I like champagne. I like using it as my first course meal. I mean, for my first course wine. If I'm gonna have like a whole bunch of different wines, but you can have it as your one. You can pair many many different champagnes yeah. throughout your entire course. Absolutely, you know, every and course also we have its own separate, uh, champagne. Also with cheese. Yes, but there is one thing with which I do not recommend my champagne because we are extra brut, that is, without uh, much sugar. Mm -hmm. Never drink Bruno Payard with desserts yes. or with sweets. Because, because then, yeah. then you will only, it will be terribly conflicting with the sugar of the sweets. So the only thing you will perceive in your mouth would be the acidity, which is, which is uh, wrong, of course. But yeah. anything... Uh, that is not uh, sweet, which uh, no, no no sugar goes very well. So yeah. you can have it with poultry, you can have it with all sorts of chicken, uh, lamb. It goes very well with lamb, with cheeses. So many many choices. Yeah, and, and that's that's true with a lot of wines. You know, I know a lot of people like to pair chocolate with like red wine, and you can do that, but a lot of times the chocolate makes the wine more bitter. You know, that's why you kind of want the, your your dessert wine to be as sweet, if not sweeter, than the dessert. I agree with you. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not too keen on yeah. that. Yeah, I've done it, and I, I've done it plenty of times, but I know that I'm going to get that bitterness, so I yeah. expect that. But if I really want to pair it right, I'm drinking, if I'm having red wine with a, like a chocolate or a dessert, then it's I'm making sure that the sweetness levels are at least pretty close, if not the the the, uh, the uh, wine being sweeter. So, uh, but yeah, I mean. Champagne is an awesome, awesome beverage, and um, this one is outstanding. We tasted a few other ones. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, the 2009, which we don't, it's not actually even ah. ready yet, um, won't be ready by the time this this is out. But um, um, otherwise, I would have had the 09 to make it to make it like that, 09. That, that, that's, that's still a little <laughs> secret. It will be released in September. Okay? Yeah, it'll, it'll, it's a few more months. Um, voilà. It'll be well worth it because what we had was already super, super Thank you. nice. Thank you. Um, I'm sure it'll benefit for a few more months in bottle, yeah. and um, but yeah, um, it will be a release when it's exactly ten years. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, uh, you know, time costs more than sugar, but it, yeah. it, deliver, it delivers very different, exactly, very different wines. Absolutely. So, uh, thank you very much for uh, your interest in Maison Bruno Payard. Maybe the last thing, if I may add something, Absolutely, is that please. we are completely family on Maison. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not belong to any uh, group, but uh, Maison Bruno Payard uh, will continue uh, after me. My daughter uh, Alice is in charge. Yes. And uh, uh, more and more, because I am uh, now getting a little more, uh, I would say, a little more mature. So I need, yes. a, I need to take a little more vacation. Yeah, you're, uh, you're from, from going time to, to enjoy, time. Some, enjoy life yeah, a little more, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, As I, you should. Also, I have always been enjoying life because it's a great privilege to to be able to make a living out of your passion. Absolutely. That's something that not everybody has a 
chance to do. And uh, I, if I may recommend one thing to younger people, I always say, do what you love to do because that's the only way you will do it well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I agree with that. So, um, you know, this this is my passion of love. You know, um, I, of course, all my viewers know I never mentioned exactly where I work, but you know, I do work in the I do work in the industry. I just don't. This is not my actual job, but I love doing this so much that I'm willing to fly to Germany to meet this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you. Beaucoup. Pleasure. Right? And thank you for your attention. Absolutely. <laughs>
So yeah, so it have, so it got cold and the yeast kind of goes dormant, they go to sleep. It, so the yeast only ferments in a certain temperature range. So in their caves, so their coves, it gets colder, and these priests stay pretty constant, but it gets colder in the winter, obviously. And so they go to sleep, and then in the spring and summer, it gets warmer, and they're like, ooh, okay. And they start eating the sugar again, and so they do the fermentation. And then when they were putting it into bottles, um, these bottles weren't strong enough at first, which you mentioned because they were wood-fired, but England saved them because um, England was using coal to make strong glass. So they used, started using that, and now the, these glasses can handle uh, six atmospheres of pressure. Is that that's basically what is in a champagne bottle? So that's why you have to be careful. I don't know if you noticed in that interview, but I kind of like when he was opening the champagne, I kind of leaned back a little bit. He's kind of pointed at me. I was like, uh, I know he knows how to open champagne, but still, like, just like you just gotta like, don't point it at me. But um, so yeah, uh, Bruno was awesome. I really appreciate that he he spent some time with me um, to uh, to you know talk about the champagne. Um, and I mean, I was a little bit late to that little tasting and I walked in, I didn't, I really didn't understand exactly how, who knew that was coming and all that. And I kind of walk in, of course, got my t-shirt on and his, his daughter is like, hi. I'm like, like as if she recognized me, I've never met her. Okay. And they had a seat for me. I'm like, cool. I sat down. I had to kind of catch up. Um, and then I was like, okay, I was done. And I was like, gonna like try to look, ask someone to say, hey, I'm here to see Bruno. And they're like, hey, Mark, how you doing? I'm like, wow, they, they knew who I was, which always floors me when that happens, you know, when I go to places. I just kind of think I'm just some dude. Anyway, um, so yeah, like the wines? Yes. Cool? Yes. All right. So um, is there another slide after this? I'm, I'm going to click the button. There's end credits. You need to watch the entire end credits. Just saying. If you've seen any Marvel movies, you need to see the end credits, okay? <laughs> All the way to the end. Yes, Scott, I was recording. <laughs> Dad didn't realize I was doing that, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Oh, conclusion, yes. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all again. Thank all of you uh, over the years for watching. Uh, again, this guy and that lady, and where's Austin? Anyway, the people that have been taking care of you all at, at High Street, I have this picture for a reason, and it's right there. They, they embody this. They live and breathe hospitality first. Right, Laura? Right? Yes? Um, so um, this is another reason why I'm so happy to be able to use their facility here. They're closed on Monday nights normally, so um, it's, it was easy to do this, and I thank them for allowing me to do this for everybody. Scott really didn't understand exactly what he was getting into. I think he's okay with all this now. Um, when I was bringing all the equipment in, he's kind of like, how much more do you have? I'm like, don't worry, I got it, because he had work to do. This was this morning. Um, so yeah, uh, so standard sign-off. So, all right, everybody, thank you all for stopping by. Um, click the links above to friend me up. There'll be links below about uh, the wineries, and I don't know, there'll be some other stuff down there. Uh, if you want to hit a donate button, Want to hit a donate button, the PayPal button, you can do that. Send me some ducats. Uh, and so the end titles, all of you, it's about seven-ish minutes. It's two songs for you at home. I don't own the I don't own the copyrights to the music I use, so you get to use my full-length version of the end title song, and they're going by really fast. All right. Good night. <laughs>